so good up af good afternoon to everyone this is our instruction course on uh, ultra wide field photography retinal photography and specifically how it changed my practice pattern uh, the chief instructor unfortunately dr rohan savant could not uh, be with us today so uh, we shall continue in his absence and i'll start with an introduction to the course as well as you know um, my topic which was autofluorescence uh, we have with us excellent speakers and i'm sure anybody watching this online uh, at a later date will be uh, you know benefited by their expertise and experience so um, i'm dr devendra venkatramani i practice at uh, panvel at lakshmi eye hospital and institute and i'll be giving a brief overview on ultra wide field color photography and autofluorescence so what is ultra wide field imaging initially uh, in the early days we were using uh, standard fundus cameras and while there is really no definition as such as to what is uh, a normal field a wide field and an ultra wide field conventionally up to 50 degrees of field of view is called a normal field 50 degrees to 100 degrees field of view is called wide field and more than 100 degrees field of view is called ultra wide field so um, i'm just showing you a few of the images of different machines that are available in the market today this is the um, idon machine and this has a 90 degree field of view so technically it does not qualify for ultra wide field but probably a wide field the uh, if you montage the images you can get up to 133 degrees field of view and these are some of the images from our patients when this machine was with us for a short time on the other hand the zeiss claris uh, 500 and the zeiss claris 700 provide a 133 degrees field of view in a single image and if you stitch together two images side by side actually the computer does this automatically you can get up to 200 degrees field of view um the other one was with, with of which dr prashant bavankoye has this it's the mirante by nidec a uh, beautiful machine with a 163 degrees field of view in the uh, you know in in one image and these are this is just one of the images that sir has taken and published as a cover image of ophthalmology and these are the images from optos which in a single image can cover 200 degrees field of view in the horizontal uh, meridian that's important to note in the vertical meridian the field of view is a little restricted and there may be lash artifacts not very clearly seen in these images thankfully but you would often see them in an optos image so um, since we have the optos with us most of my talk will be restricted to uh, photographs from the optos machine just as a brief overview this is a very easy to use machine the patient has to just uh, gradually bring his or her eye to the uh, uh, camera aperture over there which is covered by a silicon sleeve so there is uh, you know it's protected from dust and in a inadvertent touching and here you can see how uh, uh, a technician can gu gently guide the patient's head and then the machine takes a photograph in a matter of a few seconds so it's very easy to use a little bit of a comparison of the different uh, cameras which i showed you uh, the first uh, image on your left is a montage of our conventional topcon fundus camera which has only a 50 degrees field of view and stitching together these multiple images we can see that this patient has a scleral buckling surgery that has been done and that there are um, some uh, suture erosions intravitreal suture erosions in this quadrant and one more suture which has come out over here this patient has a ref had a re uh, refractive error of, of about minus 10 degrees so, uh, sorry minus 10 diopters unfortunately with the idon machine we could not uh, you know really image the suture even in a montage view so this probably was a, one of the major limitations of this machine whereas when we imaged the same eye with optos you can see that not only these two but there's another third suture also that has eroded in another quadrant so just showing you how the wider field of view can really change your outlook and change your uh, perspective on uh, of a particular patient some more interesting photographs you know we are uh, uh, these are uh, images of uh, regmatogenous retinal detachment where you can see the large horseshoe tear inferiorly with multiple smaller breaks and the extent of the uh, rd and uh, what is more important to understand in all of these ultra wide field uh, techniques is that the periphery looks a little magnified compared to what it actually is 
and definitely magnified compared to the uh, posterior pole simply because of the you know uh, the uh, linear magnification that is achieved and also because of the fact that we are condensing a three dimensional bowl shaped retina into a flattening it out into a two dimensional image so uh, the horseshoe tear in real life is probably not as big as this but in the uh, in the optus photo it looks fairly big some more images of regmatogenous retinal det detachment. I'm deliberately showing these because I think we were all trained with this very meticulous surgical planning and diagram and we used to draw these very detailed diagrams much to the discomfort of the patient and many times we overlooked and, and uh, persisted despite the patient's discomfort whereas now we really don't need to. We can have these beautiful images which can be displayed in our uh, OTs as well and while you are doing your buckling surgery you can look at this image uh, and you know identify the landmarks intraoperatively without having to depend upon a meticulous fundus diagram. Obviously, the great value of these images lie in patient education and counseling. These are some images of uh, the eye, uh, two eyes of a patient who has undergone PRP and here you can reassure the patient that the diabetic retinopathy has regressed and there are no bleeding spots and these are the laser marks that you had experienced while you know the laser was being done. Whereas uh, this patient would have unstable diabetic retinopathy and you can explain the reason for those floaters that he is seeing and also ex explain where are the areas that you wish to touch up the laser to and um, you know show him changes over a period of time. So some more images of you know laser and diabetic retinopathy. A very interesting uh, use of this machine is uh, in retinopathy of prematurity. These images are very difficult to take and obviously they have to be done in the hospital setting as opposed to the NICU setting. There are special positions of holding the baby that are described called the flying baby or the superman baby uh, position in which the eye can be brought close to the machine. But I think these are beautiful images to educate uh, parents as to what is the actual nature of the disease and how the disease has regressed once you've treated it. So uh, while we all use electronic medical records, the conventional laptop or computer desktop may not be adequate to ex to use in this uh, with this machine you probably would require a wider field monitor as well as the camera and once you have a nice large uh, computer monitor it makes a lot of difference to um, you know see those images yourself because the quality is going to be poorer if your monitor uh, resolution is bad and uh, here of course patients uh, would not be able to appreciate all the details unless you have a nice large screen to show it to them Another big value of these images is for teaching and just as I'm able to demonstrate all of these lesions to you here today, we have uh, postgraduates and fellows where you can show the image to, to the postgraduate and explain that, you know, uh, this is where the, the operculated hole is. Now, why don't you have a look at the patient and follow these landmarks and come to this operculated hole so that you know, I know that you have actually seen this many times. And we've, we are all guilty of this during our residency days when the consultant would ask us, did you see the lesion? And you would all, we would all nod, yes, yes, I saw it without having actually seen anything at all. Now, um, one of the described uses of this modality is for preoperative retina screening. This is a patient who uh, came for uh, pre-LASIK screening and you can see that there is a pigmented lesion in the periphery, probably just some pigment, but there's a small atrophic hole also associated with it. And uh, we've done a laser barrage and you know, it's so nicely documented in all of these images. And a nice study done from Narayan Netrale, which talked about the inter-observer but also agreement but also the sensitivity of optos for screening uh, peripheral lesions in pre-LASIK uh, patients and they found that this, uh, the sensitivity or the detection rate was very high 78 percent which as a screening modality is excellent. So it, it's obvious that if you find even one lesion you are going to barrage that if you are going ahead with LASIK. So uh, if it's a positive test then your work is done. If the test is negative you may then consider dilating the patient and looking at the fundus in more detail. Uh, there is, there are limitations of any technology. This is, uh, you know, one of the patients who had come for uh, screening, and you can see not only the lash artifact, but here, if you look, inspect the periphery, it looks quite good, quite normal. But in the superior views, you can see a nice pigmented lattice, which you would have missed if you had looked at only the first image. And 
in the inferior view as well, there's another lattice with holes. So it's important to take these superior and inferior views also and not depend solely on the uh, single view that is focused on the posterior pole. Following up certain specific patients is also you know, a great, a great application of this technology. This is a patient with a two millimeter pupil with uh, ankylosing spondylitis. He's a one-eyed patient. He's had all this laser barrage done in the past, waiting for him to dilate in the OPD for an hour by putting multiple applications of tropicacil uh, drops uh, just wastes a lot of time. Whereas in one image, you can uh, undilated, this is an undilated image, you can see how well the laser has been done and he does not require any further treatment. So, you know, everybody is happy when uh, this uh, is done. Similarly, another high myope whose uh, lattices have been nicely barraged, he's very reassured whenever he sees, sees these images that he has no fresh lesions. And of course, some uh, follow-up studies where you can uh, see how the uh, lesions can improve over a period of time by drainage of blood or, with intervention or without intervention. Some more interesting cases of you know, dislocated crystalline lenses in an eight-year-old child with Marfan syndrome and um, you can you can see how you can see the aura in such exquisite detail that's that's the aura of course the child is practically aphakic that's why you can see so much but uh, some very interesting photos so it's an invaluable technology when it comes to surgical planning patient education and counseling and all those uh, you know uh, instances that i mentioned but it has very important limitations i don't think we can say that it's a, it's a substitute to binocular indirect ophthalmoscopy you can't use it in a recumbent patient or you can't really use it in a small child. There's no stereopsis. So sometimes you may not really understand whether uh, there is a mass lesion or not. Dynamic examination is obviously not possible. And as you could see, all the images are red, green in color in the optus simply because it uses two, uh, uh, two different lasers, a red laser and a green laser and stitches those images together. So you get all these false color image artifacts. And of course, the cost is quite prohibitive. So for uh, you know commonplace use, that's a major limitation. So I, I, I've shown some of these images before. This is a series of dislocations of you know, um, uh, structures into the vitreous cavity. This was a patient who, after anti-VEGF injection, where few air bubbles had also gone in, was very concerned because he was seeing these circles and we could reassure him that they are nothing but air bubbles which will disappear in a few days. I'll move on to the to my actual topic, which is ultra wide field autofluorescence. And while autofluorescence is a, a technology that has been around for decades and is based on lipofusion accumulation, our talks today are all uh, focused on how ultra wide field imaging has changed our practice. So I'll be restricting my clinical examples to some of these clinical entities, which are obviously characterized by abnormal lipofusion ac accumulation, but where ultra wide field autofluorescence really made a difference. So this is a, a one in interesting situation in a patient with asteroid, hy asteroid hyalosis, where the view of the fundus is so poor, this is a diabetic patient, and we're really not sure whether the patient has any level of diabetic retinopathy or not. Doing an autofluorescence can get at least a good amount of detail and can tell us that we're not dealing with any proliferative disease or there are, and also that there are no hemorrhages or hard exudates in the retina. This was the right eye and this is another patient. The left eye of the patient has very dense asteroids, but you can also somehow make out that there is there are some yellow lesions in a circinate pattern in the uh, macular area and the autofluorescence shows that these are the black spots which are the microaneurysms that are leaking over there and of course few more microaneurysms and hemorrhages. Uh, so uh, asteroid hyalosis is not an impediment to autofluorescence and I think OC, uh, neither for OCT so I think these are very useful tools in imaging a patient with dense asteroid hyalosis. In fact, we had presented this in uh, 2012 uh, VRSI, uh, role of autofluorescence uh, in asteroid hyalosis. But of course, this was not ultra wide field at that time. We had used the conventional fundus camera. Now, uh, we, we're all familiar with this situation of RPE tracks in a patient with chronic CSR. And uh, in uh, truly in an ultra wide field, you can see the extent of that tract and extent of how you know uh, it's going down into the inferior periphery. Some nice, interesting uh, patients with UVITDs. This was a patient who had uh, this mass lesion in the posterior pole, inferior to the uh, macula, with folds in the retina in the uh, macula. And the autofluorescence shows hyper-autofluorescence at the borders with some stippling. 
and this sort of pushed us in the direction of uh, posterior scleritis. Of course, that correlated with the patient's symptomatology. I won't say it's the only test you are going to depend upon, but this is a patient with a nodular posterior scleritis where there was hyperautofluorescence because of the activity of the lesion. Now, this is another patient with uh, multifocal choroiditis and this, these images are taken over a period of one year. The patient has been on treatment with steroids and uh, you know there are some disease-free intervals. But we've done serial autofluorescence, ultra-wide field autofluorescence in him and we can nicely see how initially the disease was active with the hyperautofluorescence. It started becoming inactive. When there was recurrences, there was reactivation and hyper again and the lesion is creeping along despite treatment because of loss of follow-up and now new lesions are cropping up in new locations which are not there in the past so this sequential ultra wide field uh, you know um, analysis really helps us in now ha having shifted over this patient onto immunosuppressions along with this uh, immunosuppressants along with the steroids this is just one last patient who had very vague visual symptoms of you know, detailed fundus examination showed only very few spots which are not even visible on the uh, uh, color fundus. But when you do the autofluorescence, you can see the numerous spots in a white dot syndrome that told us that this is, uh, you know, uh, a white dot uh, syndrome which the patient has and it's something, you can see the extent of those lesions over here. The last group is, you know, patients with uh, heridomacular degeneration. These are uh, this is the uh, our autofluorescence in a patient with uh, ABCA4 retinopathy as it's now called, as Targats is now called. And we can see that the lesions extend into the mid-periphery as well and are not only focused in the posterior pole as we would probably have thought. These are some more eyes that you can see where the extent of the lesion is. And what is classical is this space around the optic disc, the peripapillary region where there are no flecks. This, this area is always spared in a Stargardt or ABCA4 retinopathy. And this was an unconventional ABCA4 presentation where there's only macular lesion and there are no yellow pisiform lesions. And we were not sure whether this is an RP epithelitis or some other disease. But going into literature, and you can see it very clearly over here, uh, you can see this demarcation line. And this demarcation line is something we learned last year is typical of ABCA4 associated disease. So if you have a patient with Stargardt and you're uh, not sure if this is Stargardt or not, if you do the autofluorescence and find this demarcation line and you can see it in all of now, now that we know it's there, we can see it in all of these earlier images as well. And this tells us that this is uh, most likely to be ABCA4 associated retinopathy. Uh, the last slide, this is a patient with retinopathy of, uh, retinitis pigmentosa and there are multiple forms of autofluorescence described in RP but this is probably something that is closest to our understanding where there is a sparing of the macula and total loss or ab abnormal hypo uh, autofluorescence in the periphery and this is probably the, the only functional retinal tissue currently present in the eye. So with that, I will uh, conclude my talk. Of course, we can have discussion later.